At a time when historic diseases like cholera, smallpox, and tuberculosis were still decimating the masses, something was brewing in the science world. Two great minds were making some of the most important discoveries in the history of mankind, and in the span of just a few decades. But though these two men were jointly serving mankind, between them was a fierce rivalry. A rivalry which was not just intensely personal, but which was fueled by nationalism. Welcome to Intrigued Mind, and this is the story of how a German and a Frenchman faced off in a feud so competitive but so fruitful that it would change the course of medicine forever. This is the story of Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, pioneers in bacteriology, and their dispute over anthrax, the apotheosis of their titanic rivalry. In 1870, France and Prussia, soon to be Germany, were locked into a war which would have monumental consequences on the future of Europe. It would end with the humiliating and rapid defeat of France. Besides being forced to pay a crippling indemnity, enduring the devastating siege of Paris in 1871 and losing her second empire at the same time that the German Empire was officially proclaimed, France was stripped of the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, wounds which the French would never forget. Meet Louis Pasteur. At the time, Pasteur was a renowned chemist who had made a name for himself after working in the beer and wine industries. His discovery that organisms played a part in the fermentation of alcohol was groundbreaking, and he refuted a centuries-old belief called spontaneous generation, which held that living creatures could arise from non-living matter. This he debunked using cell theory. Around the same time the Franco-Prussian War broke out in 1870, Pasteur was just returning to Paris after spending nearly a year in an imperial residence near the Adriatic at the request of Napoleon III. Within the span of only two weeks of his return, the emperor had been captured and defeated, and the French army completely overwhelmed by German speed and numerical superiority. Pasteur, initially a Germanophile, was devastated, writing, Each of my works, until my dying breath, will bear this epigraph. Down with Prussia. Revenge. Revenge. On the other side of the Rhine, a Prussian physician, 20 years younger than Pasteur, was working as a local doctor for the country town of Wolstein in Polish Prussia. This man was Robert Koch. The war had also stripped him of any francophilia generated from French medical advances, and his service as a military doctor had also disillusioned him to the war effort. Now, Robert Koch was more than a physician. He was interested in identifying the causes of diseases at the molecular level and when he wasn't treating patients, would spend hours analyzing organisms under his homemade microscope. The first disease he turned his attention to was anthrax, a pernicious disease which particularly ravaged grazing livestock, but also humans. There was a great mystery with anthrax. Farmers complained that on certain fields, grazing animals would repeatedly succumb to anthrax year after year, regardless of the passing of seasons. They were called cursed fields as a result. But for medical minds, there had to be some kind of explanation Koch had already started working with anthrax-infected blood, using animals like mice and frogs. He noticed that a certain rod-shaped structure was always present in the blood of infected animals, but also that after a few days, the blood lost its ability to cause disease. How could livestock in the cursed fields then routinely fall victim to anthrax outbreaks? Koch needed to observe the bacteria, and for this, he needed to cultivate it. He did this using the liquid from cow's eyes as a medium, which he got from his local butchers. In his observations of the bacteria's life cycle, he found something strange. Whenever new cells formed, black dots appeared and expanded on the rod-shaped filaments. But even after the filament had decomposed, bacteria would emerge from those dots. For Koch, there was only one explanation. Spores. These were dehydrated, resilient bacteria that appeared in harsh environments and could spend months in hibernation before reactivating in an environment that was favorable for them to grow again. This explained how anthrax could strike again and again in the so-called cursed fields. Koch published his findings in an 1876 article, which was groundbreaking. He had officially identified the pathogen responsible for causing anthrax, naming it Bacillus anthracis. At 32 years old, he became the first person to establish a causal link between a specific microorganism and an infectious disease. When Pasteur found out that a small-town physician with seemingly little microbiological experience had applied his germ theory on a disease which could infect animals and humans, he wasn't particularly ecstatic. Worst of all, this man was German. So, in the spring of 1877, Pasteur published the first of many papers on anthrax. Did he play fair? Well, not so much. Firstly, 
He didn't use Koch's term bacillus anthracis to describe the disease, but instead bacteridia. This was a term used by an earlier French scientist called Casimir de Vain, whom Pasteur claimed was truly the first to have discovered the microorganism. Though Pasteur conceded that Koch was the first to observe the bacteria's life cycle, this was in a footnote, and he wasn't convinced by Koch's scientific process, writing that it didn't sufficiently exclude that another element could cause the disease. Pasteur finally claimed that he himself was the first to identify spores while working on diseases affecting silkworms in the 1860s, research which rescued the lucrative French silk industry from collapsing. For Pasteur, much more conclusive evidence was necessary. Of course, he was the man to provide it. Up to then, though, Pasteur had mainly been applying science to industry. It appears that the switch to infectious diseases was spurred on by Koch's challenge, whether personal or nationalistic. Ultimately, Pasteur did manage to prove that Bacillus anthracis was the causal agent of anthrax, using a technique with sterile urine in different flasks, which he had used with his work on beer sterilization. In his mind, this was the definitive proof of causation. And while it did conform more to expectations of the scientific process at the time, many questioned whether the experiments were really necessary. Koch certainly was not going to stand by idly. In an 1881 article, he struck back saying, only a few of Pasteur's belief about anthrax are new, and they are false. Koch rejected some of Pasteur's experiments as worthless and even naive, ridiculing his work with chickens and earthworms. Indeed, Pasteur had found that earthworms were responsible for the spread of anthrax in the so-called cursed fields, passing on the bacteria from the corpses of infected sheep buried in the fields onto healthy sheep that ingested them. Koch considered this an overly simplistic challenge to his work on spores. Later, in the summer of 1881, at the International Congress of Medicine in London, Pasteur and Koch met for the first time. This was a huge event. With the leading medical minds of the time assembled all together in one room, Pasteur was one of the Congress's main acts. His work on proving germ theory had catapulted him to international fame, but he had also advanced his work on infectious diseases. In the late 1870s, Pasteur had developed pioneering vaccines against chicken cholera and, more importantly, anthrax which he had demonstrated to great acclaim in spectacularly bold public experiments. The most famous of these took place on a farm before huge crowds and involved an experiment with 50 sheep, half of which were inoculated with the vaccine, the other half of which were not. The month-long experiment ended in the predicted results. All the unvaccinated sheep died, whereas all the vaccinated ones remained healthy. This catapulted him to international stardom almost overnight and was a decisive moment in the history of immunology. But back to the Congress. Pasteur, a gifted orator, took to the stage before an admiring audience. Koch, of course, was present. Pasteur then began to detail his inoculation experiments with anthrax and cholera. Although he congratulated Koch on tracing the life of Bacillus anthracis, Pasteur didn't mention Koch's work in identifying the pathogen and establishing it as the cause of anthrax, instead claiming that he had done it. Koch was furious. After having spent the past five years studying anthrax, Pasteur was stealing his thunder. At that same Congress, Koch and Pasteur were later invited to the laboratory of Joseph Lister, the acclaimed British surgeon who had developed his famous antiseptic methods based on Pasteur's germ theory. Koch was invited to show his inventions of photographing microscopic findings and his coloring methods to identify pure bacterial colonies. Pasteur hadn't read Koch's scolding last article and, impressed by Koch's work, warmly shook his hand, saying, This is great progress, sir. Then they parted ways. But eventually, Pasteur would read the article. One year later, in September of 1882, Pasteur, while delivering a public lecture in Geneva, answered the criticisms leveled at him and his teams one by one. Koch was present in the audience. Given the virulence of Koch's tone in the article, Pasteur was surprisingly cool and repeated former claims that he alone carried out experiments on the anthrax pathogen, which met existing standards for scientific research. But he also ridiculed Koch and his disciples, saying, to summarize, not one of the critiques leveled by Koch or his students stand up to the test. They have merely highlighted the plethora of mistakes and the inexperience of their authors. Things took an ugly turn from there. Koch, who was in the audience but couldn't understand French, had Pasteur's speech translated to him by a German colleague. Several times, Pasteur mentioned a rouquet à la monde, French for a German journal, referring to the medical journal which contained Koch's scolding article. The interpreter kept mistranslating rouquet as orgue, meaning pride in French. Koch was enraged at the nationalist undertones at a scientific convention and lost his cool. He embarrassed himself by repeatedly trying to interrupt Pasteur before it was his turn to go to the stage. 
Knowing that Pasteur was a much better orator, and given the language barrier, a debate would have been fruitless, so he vowed to reply to the criticism by means of journals. Three months later, Koch published another scathing attack, insinuating Pasteur had falsified his results in the inoculation program and defending his own scientific method, which would allow him to declare ownership over discovery of the anthrax pathogen. Pasteur responded with a long rebuke. This more emotional letter showed his shock at the virulence of his opponent's attacks, and once again defended Pasteur from the criticisms. This bitter correspondence over anthrax alone would remain alive until 1887, almost 10 years after Koch had published his first findings on the Bacillus anthracis and the spores. Historians generally view Koch as more polemical and more sarcastic, denigrating Pasteur's work when credit was due. He claimed Pasteur was not a physician and was an unreasonable skeptic of Pasteur's rabies and cholera vaccines, even going so far as to check whether the rabid dog that had bitten the patient whom Pasteur had inoculated was indeed rabid. Pasteur, though clearly bothered by Koch and often envious of his achievements, was more impartial and provided arguments that reflected the opinions of their contemporaries. During this time, though, the two men jointly proved the causal link between Bacillus and Thrasis and anthrax, a milestone in medical history. And yes, Koch's terminology is the one remembered today. But that wasn't all. Pasteur developed vaccines for rabies, chicken cholera, and anthrax, some of the biggest scientific breakthroughs on record. Koch pioneered the field of microbiology with technical innovations like the play technique to identify pure bacterial colonies as well as inventing microphotography. With his methods, he also identified two of the most lethal diseases in history, cholera and tuberculosis. In doing so, they formed two schools of microbiology, advanced by their disciples. The Pasteurians were predominantly interested in immunity and ways to protect humans and animals from infectious diseases. Koch and his disciples, however, favored public health measures to control infectious diseases, relying more on sanitary methods to protect populations. But this dualism might never have occurred without Koch's first work on anthrax and the challenge it posed to another man's ego. It ignited a great feud of one-upmanship, fed by personal and nationalistic motivations, which would change humanity forever. If this rivalry hadn't existed, there's no knowing whether these two great minds could have achieved all they did. A telling fact is this. After the death of Pasteur in 1895, Koch would make no major contributions to the field of microbiology. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video, and leave your suggestions in the comments below.